we've received a, a couple of emails from people who are in the uh, path of Irma. By the way, there was an article about a couple in Spokane. Um, he's 104, and his name is Harvey. She's 93, and her name is Irma. <laughs> and they said they're just swept away by what's happening, <laughs> by the coincidence. OK, so one person says, um, I've lived in Florida for 14 years. We weathered out Hurricane Wilma and several other smaller threats. Um, but please comment on facing impending natural disasters. We're here making preparations, waiting. But anyone who's lived where hurricanes are a threat can understand when I say the frenzy, the frantic anxiety, and fear-filled fear energy that arises is intense. And then a second email, um, they said, we live in Key Largo, Florida, and Hurricane Irma is expected to hit this Saturday. We have evacuated to Tennessee, to my mom's house, with a friend from Miami, my in-laws from Key Largo, and my cousins, along with their children. Needless to say, we have a packed full home. We were all very tired and very, very worried for our homes and some of our friends who have decided against our best wishes to stay in the Keys. We are a very small, tight community, and any prayers would be greatly appreciated as we were all terrified of what devastation this uh, storm may uh, cause. Two things I made sure to bring with me are the books Open Heart, Clear Mind, and Pearl of Wisdom, Book One. OK, and then she asked for some readings. Uh, and how can I tame my mind and heart right now? How can I help, but, but how can I not help but worry about my home, where I grew up and I'm now raising my daughter, my neighborhood and our town? I have not realized how strong my attachment to this whole area and all the people in it were until yesterday when we left. This has been uh, much tougher than I imagined it would be. OK, so with these two, we really see the kind of stress pe people are experiencing. With um, It seems to be with both of them that part of it is uh, you know, the, the stress and anxiety about their homes and their property, and also about um, the the second email, they, they're in Tennessee, but they're worried about their friends who decided to stay in the Keys. And the first one, it, it sounds like they may still be there, that they decided not to go. It doesn't say explicitly, yeah, it doesn't say where they are, but it, they may still have decided to be there. So how do you deal with it? So when I think about it, and if I put myself in their shoes, yeah. One thing I would do is beforehand, I would really think clearly. Um, if there's danger to life, I think life is more important than property. Get out. You know, it isn't worth risking your life to stay there to protect your property. And, uh, and then, you know, if you leave, just, you know, of course, you're anxious about your friends who decided to stay, but that's their choice. You know, it's like dealing with aged parents who don't want to go into assisted living, even though it's dangerous where they're staying. You know, the people who decide to stay there have made their own decisions. There's adults. There's nothing we can do. Shanti, you know, Shanti Deva said, if when there's like a problem or something, if there's something you can do about it, no need to be angry or be worried. If there's nothing you can do about it, also no need to be angry and be worried. In other words, anger or worry or anxiety really have no purpose at all. And so remembering that, I think, is, is very, very helpful. 
because like we were talking about last time, last week, sometimes we have the thought in our mind that unless I worry, unless I'm anxious, I don't really care. So throw that thought out. That's not a realistic thought. Yeah, anxiety and worry are not an indication of how much you care about somebody. Yeah, they're a more, more of an indication about how the uncontrolled mind functions to make you miserable. Okay? So it's better in those situations, if you have friends or relatives who decided to stay, send them love and compassion, wish them well, dedicate prayers for them, and relax. That's the most practical thing to do. Yeah? Um, yeah, so really banish that thought that says, unless I am an emotional wreck, I don't really care about them, even though there's nothing I can do to help them. Yeah. Um, the second thing is about the, the fear of losing your property and things. Yeah, it's true. You know, sometimes all this anxiety and nostalgia, we were talking about that nostalgia, uh, melancholy, this has been so much a part of my life, how can I let it go, you know, and that arises, and, you know, it's very easy, I know for myself, to kind of indulge in that, yeah, there's a certain heart pull, you know, um, but then when I really think about it, it's like, well, it's just stuff, you know, it's not really part of my life. It's not who I am. It comes, it goes. It's nice that I had that as long as I did. And if it's not there when I go back, well, we'll make something new. You know, we're not going to be out on the streets. FEMA will give some aid. You know, they've already been doing a lot of planning in Florida. And you know, we'll just make a new home. And, you know, that wasn't what I had in my plans, but life often comes with events that we didn't put in our plans that we can't control. And so the best thing to do in those situations is just say, okay, that was, I put it down. It was, and especially, you know, be so thankful you got out. You're in Tennessee where you're safe. You're not there. You know, your possessions are, may or may not be there, but they aren't your life. And, you know, you can start your life over somewhere else. And, you know, it's an adjustment, but we sentient beings are very resilient. And, you know, if we realize that we're resilient and adaptable, the change becomes easier. If we hold on to what was, wanting it to, to come back, even though we can't make it come back, then our own mind makes us miserable. So it's kind of, you know, what do we do with our mind in these situations? Yeah, how, how do we look at these situations? And so, of course, they're going to bring out old dysfunctional emotional habits, but if you're a Dharma practitioner, it's also a wonderful opportunity to identify those old dysfunctional ha emotional habits. Then think about what is there in the Dharma that you can train your mind and practice again and again thinking so that uh, you can put those things down and approach life with a much uh, happier and healthier attitude. Yeah. And so, you know, we always think even you're living in a place and you're in a tight community with your friends and everything seems very stable. We feel like, oh, this is all going to remain as it is. But we, there's no guarantee in samsara. Mexico, uh, early this morning or late last night, uh, in southwest Mexico, I had an 8.2 uh, earthquake. 8.2 is huge. It's a huge earthquake. Nobody had that put in their calendar for that day, you know? And so 
sometimes the shock of the thing is, is, gets to you most. But then afterwards, you just kind of say, okay, that happened. This is the situation. Yeah. How can I be kind to other people in this situation? What can I do in a practical way that can help myself, help the people I care about, help strangers? Yeah. And, and then you go on. And, you know, also, although it's hard to think about when you're stressed, often so there's a lot of positive things that come from these kind of situations, you know, because they've noted, like in, in Houston, all these people helping each other, you know, people that wouldn't ordinary social, ordinarily socialize or talk to each other, all of a sudden are going out and rescuing each other. Yeah. Isn't that something? Isn't that quite wonderful? Yeah. And yes, people are crowded in shelters, but wow, how many people have come forward and offered mattresses and clothes and other things? And so let yourself feel the support that other people are giving you. And know that you're not out there all on your own. You know that many people are offering resources and, and so on and help to, to help you. We have one friend in, he's in the area between Georgia and South Carolina, and his wife and child evacuated, but he decided to stay behind to help the Red Cross shelter. Isn't that amazing? You know, in Harvey, all these people coming from, what was it, the uh, Cajun Navy, these are people coming from outside of Houston, you know, in there with their their boats to, to rescue people. So you often in these situations see a side of humanity that that you don't often, you know, always see. And so it's a wonderful chance to make really heartfelt connections with people. And especially... You know, if you're around other people who are stressed, if you can be quiet, then you can be an example for those people and help them see that, you know, you don't really need to, to get all whacked out. You know, How did, what did they say? One breath at a time. Yeah. And you just do it and make your focus being kind and extending compassion to everybody. And then that helps you and it helps others. And for all those people stuck in Harvey or Irma or the earthquake, the fires that we have all around us too, you know, to, to know that people like us are making prayers for you and there's a lot of other people on this planet, plus the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas making prayers. And so our job is, you know, put, uh, you know, do the best we can with our mental, emotional resources that we have and with um, the resources around us with other people. Yeah? And things are changing all the time. So see it as an adventure. <laughs> yeah? I mean, people may go, no, I can't see it as an adventure, it's a disaster. Well, that's your choice. You can see it as a disaster, you can see it as an adventure. It's completely up to you. But however you see it will affect how you experience it. So be aware of that. Okay. <laughs>